You are now listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. Variation, the key to unlocking health. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. All right, welcome to the Real Health Podcast. As always, I am your host, Dr. Taylor Crick, bringing you the most cutting edge information available on health and wellness today. And today we're going to talk about a, a really important topic that does not get uh, enough airtime, enough press time in the natural or or any version of healthcare realm, and, and that's something called variation, variation or variety. Okay, we've all heard that variety is the spice of life, um, but you know I'm not talking about variety like change your scenery, change your change your you know spouse, change your place where you uh, vacation, change this or that. I'm talking about variety when it comes to your healthcare, and the reason that I say that you don't hear that very often is because you know most healthcare providers, my, myself included, there's a, a you know particular camp that we relate to. Okay. So, you know, the paleo camp or the vegetarian camp or the CrossFit camp or the gut healing camp. And and all the people in that camp tend to think, talk, act very similarly or encourage, you know, a, a very similar lifestyle within that one camp. And they think that it is the the end all be all, um, but the other camps don't see it that way. And so, what I'm going to talk about today is how, you know, I, I would say that I fall into the the paleo camp, uh, but I don't want to be pigeonholed into that box because what paleo means is really just looking at the way that our ancestors lived and the way that we were designed. So when it comes to the topic of variation and variety, this is really a paleo concept. Okay, So I'm going to go through that with you guys and talk about why it's important for variation for variety. Uh, there's three main main areas we want to hit on with this variation and, and why it's so important. The, the first one that I want to talk about is diet variation, Okay, varying the foods that you eat. And, and this is a really important topic because you know, so often somebody will you know, either read a book or listen to a webinar or even, you know, a podcast like ours, and they'll hear one thing and they think, okay, this has got to be true. And, and, and a lot of times they're, 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 they might be right or they might be on the right track. But let me give you a, a good example. Juicing. Okay, juicing, great thing. I've talked about it. Other people have talked about it. You may have seen fat, sick, and nearly dead. You may have heard of people losing X number of pounds or people reversing cancer, reversing diabetes, you know, X, Y, or Z symptom being reversed through the powers of juicing. But let's use that as our first example. I think that juicing is great, but I don't necessarily think that somebody should be juicing all the time. And let me go into that a little bit further. Juicing, some of the benefits of juicing. One, it gives your digestive system a break. Your digestive system does not have to break down any uh, fiber, any hard matter, anything like that. The, the, you know, your enzymes, things have to break down as part of the digestive process. Turn them from food into waste. Okay, and that takes a lot of energy. Your digestive system expends a lot of energy just breaking your foods down. So, you know, incredible benefit of juicing is it gives your body a break, gives your digestive system a break. They say that juicing is like a nutrient express right into your bloodstream. So, say you juice, you know, three apples and a pound of kale and a cucumber and, you know, six stalks of celery. First off, you're never going to sit down and eat that. Uh, or most people are never going to sit down and eat that in one setting the way that you could chug a juice down. So it really is the quickest, fastest way to get nutrients 
into your bloodstream. And for people that are really sick, people that are uh, really malnourished, I think that juicing is, is an amazing thing. I think it's a, an amazing thing that, you know, I, I'll do, especially more often uh, now that it's coming up to summertime, I'll definitely be doing more juicing. But so many people will hear that and that's the only health thing that they will start to do. They'll just juice and they'll just keep juicing and just keep juicing and just keep juicing. Juicing, one of the downsides of it is it without a doubt spikes your blood sugar. Spikes your blood sugar and spikes your insulin, which go hand in hand. You know, If you spike the blood sugar, insulin spikes in response to that. What that leads to is insulin resistance. Now, I'm not talking you go out and you do a 30-day juice fast, you're going to become diabetic. Uh, actually, you know, quite the opposite, I would say. But if you keep doing it forever, you keep spiking blood sugar, you keep spiking blood sugar, you keep spiking blood sugar, that is the number one way to age your body the fastest. Insulin spikes age your body faster, plain and simple. It's the number one way to burn out insulin receptors, which will eventually start causing weight gain. So even when people do a lot of juicing, they might juice for, for five days or for 10 days or for 15 days or, you know, for some extreme cases, 30 or 60 days, but they add in some variety. Another thing when it talks to, comes to diet, you know, that's just one example. Diet variation is just one of the strongest things that you can do for your body. Another thing that we've talked a lot about lately is something called the ketogenic diet, the ketogenic diet, putting your body into ketosis. I actually literally just measured my ketones right before I started recording this. And I was at about one and a half ketones. So when your body's producing above 0.5 up to, you know, really like six up to nine ketones, uh, that means that your body's in ketosis. That's like a, a low-carb Atkins type uh, ketogenic diet. Now, now, I'm not encouraging an Atkins diet because one of the things with low-carb is that you know, too much protein will actually turn to carbs by a process called gluconeogenesis and still spike your blood sugar. So it's a little bit different. It's what I've talked about before, you know, a plant-based paleo but high-fat diet, but a ketogenic diet. But once again, a keto diet, in my opinion, is not something that somebody should be on forever. You should come in and come out of ketosis, vary your body's metabolism. As you're doing that, one of the cool things is as you're doing that, your body's getting stronger. It's having to adapt. Okay, so going in and out of ketosis, going in and out of different juicing strategies, going in and out of different fasting strategies. That's another way you can add variety or add variation. Now, anybody guess why I don't encourage fasting all the time? Because you have to eat, right? I mean, there, uh, I have heard stories of people fasting for, for over a year, really obese people fasting for over a year. I, I don't know how that's possible. But still, it's one of those things that common sense would tell us we're not going to fast forever. But fasting for four days, fasting for 12 days, fasting for 15 days can strengthen your metabolism because your body has to go through adaptations. So that's another way that you can throw this into a four-day bone broth fast. Do a four-day uh, juice fast, like we mentioned. Do a four-day whey water fast or do a four-day water fast. This is actually an important concept that has been discussed, like, for example, in Thomas Seyfried's work, which has, you know, become wildly popular within the last couple of years in the alternative health world. He wrote a book called Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. Okay, so he's talking about how you can, how people are having great results with cancer through these different diet types. And he's not saying necessarily that going into ketosis or being in a ketogenic diet kills cancer cells. It actually does pretty specifically you know, state that, and there are some people that believe that. But I, I think that it's more of moving in and out of ketosis. The theory is that these adaptations, these changes, these stresses that you're putting on your body, the strong cells 
survive and they're able to make these adaptations that are able to you know adapt i mean quite literally the strong cells are able to adapt the weak cells are not and they begin to die off so going in and out of a ketogenic diet so if you're wondering what that means you know it's a high fat diet it's about 80 percent fat-based diet um, but you really want to limit your number of carbs so not just 80 percent but looking at how many carbs you're taking in the general rule of thumb is under 50 grams of carbs as net carbs. So that's total carbs minus fiber carbs. So let me explain that real quick because that can be confusing. If you eat a salad and a salad is 100 grams of carbs, it might be 90 grams of fiber. Okay, so those fiber carbs don't necessarily count. So you can subtract those. So it might be 10 grams of net carbs. So tracking your carb load throughout the day is how you're going to put your body into ketosis. We have patients right now that are doing a ketogenic diet and they found that, you know, they, their level for them is below 20 grams of carbs a day, staying strictly at 20 grams of carbs a day for a couple weeks, two, three weeks, usually at least three weeks. It's going to drop your blood sugar and going to increase your ketones. Why do we want to do that? Ketones are a, are a very clean burning fuel for your body, more clean than sugar. Sugar is like you know, burning diesel. Uh, it works. It gets you from point A to point B, but it's very dirty. Uh, ketones are a cleaner burning fuel. You can listen to other podcasts. You can look that up too to learn more about that. That's not what today's episode is about. But going in and out of ketosis, another thing that you can do for diet variation is like we talked about with fasting, but you can vary your fasting. You know, we teach, and Dr. Pompo, one of our mentors, teaches what's called a 5-1-1 rule, which is five days of intermittent fasting. Okay, so if you don't know what that is, go back to our podcast episode called uh, Top 10 Benefits of Intermittent Fasting. It talks about what that is. It also talks about 10 different ways that you can intermittent fast. But this is one of the ways. Dr. Papa will do five days a week of intermittent fasting. He'll do one day a week of pure fasting, 24-hour fasting, dinner to dinner typically. And he'll do one day a week of feasting. Okay, so that's enough diet variation that it keeps his body in a fasting mode, but it doesn't allow his body to ever go into a starvation mode. Because of that feasting day, your body just never thinks that it's starving, but it, the cells do get challenged. Incredibly, incredibly important. I want to give an example, too, of, you know, why this is so important. You know, uh, one great example, one obvious example is just looking at what foods are in season. Okay, so there's a you know type of people called the Hunza people, and when you look at their diet variation, they really you know epitomize this. And you think about year long, uh, what does that look like? They go through periods of ketosis, they go through periods of fasting, they go through periods of uh, foraging of more hunter gatherer types. So, and you look at this, it, it's just their environment, it's just the place that they were that they that they you know, their ancestors lived and that they continue to live. So in the winter, in the winter, they will do more hunting. Okay, they'll eat more animal products. You look at the Native Americans, you know, and, and they're eating, they're not just eating the, the flesh, they're eating every part of the animal. They're eating the fat, they're eating the organs, they're eating the liver. And that's the same with the Hunza people. They're eating a lot of animal products during the winter. This puts them into a mode of ketosis where their bodies are actually using fat as fuel. Using fat as fuel. Everybody, the leanest person, the leanest person that you know has at least 30,000 calories. Okay, so 30,000 calories. Remember, the, the, the USDA or FDA or whoever it is says that we should eat you know, 2,000 calories a day for the average person. 30,000 calories stored on you. That's half a year stored on you in fat. Even the leanest person, just in visceral fat, you have that much fat stored on you. So when your body goes into fat burning mode, it's more efficient. You can go out and go on a four day hunt where you're tracking down an animal without running out of fuel, without hitting a wall, without crashing. 
So in the winter, the Hunza people would, would be in ketosis. In the spring, when their, their you know, animal supply, their food supply would run out, they have something called starvation spring. You know, that is the in-between period where they have run out of their winter supply of food and they're waiting for the summer foods to start uh, popping up, to start sprouting, things like that. So starvation spring. So then they're in a period of fasting. Unintentionally, it's just part of their culture. It's just based on where they live and, and what they've been given. Then in the spring, it's more nuts, seeds, plants, foods that, you know, we typically think grow in spring. That's why, you know, seasonal foods are so important, you know, the, and you can get them from anywhere today. But really looking at, you know, what is your genetic uh, you know, background, what is your genetic makeup? What do you think your ancestors ate throughout the winter versus the spring versus the summer versus the fall? You know, uh, that's one thing that we can look at and just look at a, a very easy way of doing diet variation. Do you eat the same thing all year round? Do you eat the same, you know, berry salad in the summer that you do in the winter? And do those foods grow the same in the summer or the winter? And typically, they, they don't. Actually, they, they never do. They don't. So then the, the Hunzas are unintentionally doing diet variation. So that's incredibly, incredibly important. So going through seasons, going in and out of periods of ketosis, going in and out of periods of fasting, going in and out of periods maybe of, of like a, a juicing or something to boost your nutrients, going in and out of you know, intermittent fasting. These are different strategies that you can use. And when we see people employ these, we see incredible metabolic changes. Okay, so metabolic changes. That, we're talking about weight loss. We're talking about blood sugar control. We're talking about hormone changes, pre and post blood work, lab tests. Uh, metabolism is really, you know, the study I heard somebody say recently, a medical doctor say metabolism is essentially the study of your cells and how well the cells are able to produce and use energy. So strengthening your metabolism boosts your energy, helps you burn fat, helps you build muscle, but also decreases all the 21st century diseases that we're dealing with today. You know, cancer is a metabolic disease, like we mentioned Dr. Seyfried's book there. Uh, diabetes, absolutely a metabolic disease. Metabolic syndrome, okay, that's one of the things that, that many people don't even know what that means because it means a little bit of everything. It means you're overweight, it means you have diagnosed conditions, and that's most people fall into the metabolic syndrome category today. So diet variation, huge, huge, huge concept that you can take and apply to increase your health. Another one variation is supplements. Okay, so supplements, hugely, hugely, hugely important that we vary our supplements. Okay, and I mean, even if you take a multivitamin, which first off, you know, I, if you listen back to past podcast episodes, there have been times when, when I have recommended a multivitamin. Right now, I don't. Okay, so you should be getting most of your vitamins, nutrients, minerals from your diet. I believe that, that, you know, you can get many things from your diet, but I also believe that in today's society, you know, they've done soil tests, testing and comparing the soil and the nutrient density of foods today compared to foods 50, 60 years ago, and they just don't add up. There's no way around it. You can't get the same thing from your food, from your soil that you could years ago, but you could still get most of it. But most people in America, you know, I don't think we have a problem with too many deficiencies. Okay, we have more of a problem with excess or with toxicity. So, uh, you know, I don't recommend a multi, but say you take a multi. Well, first off, don't take Centrum. Uh, but if you were taking a Garden of Life multi, a, a reputable brand, still, even if it's a multi, vary that vitamin. A vitamin D, you know, a, a, a Garden of Life vitamin D for one month. Then, and for me personally, this is exactly what I do. Then the next month, I might do a liquid vitamin D. And, you know, we sell supplements on the shelves here. I buy supplements all the time from supplement stores that I don't get at cost, that I don't get at our wholesale because I want the variety and the variation. So vitamin D is a, a, another great example. The best example of this are probiotics. Okay, because that, I mean, we're hearing a lot about that today. So a lot of people, they'll go out and they, they get a probiotic. And first off, you know, a lot of them aren't that great, 
Okay, I, I, I'd say most of them. The majority of them are not that great. There's you know a handful, two, three, four brands that I can name off the top of my head that I would trust that somebody take, maybe. Um, but so many people, they, they hear about this, they go out and they get a probiotic. And say it has, you know, worst case scenario, say it has one strain. Okay, so say it has one strain like acidophilus. That is the most common strain. So you start taking acidophilus. Maybe you have a result. Maybe you don't. Uh, probably worse if you do because then you, you keep taking it. Well, what that does is it literally creates a monoculture in your gut. Really bad news. You know, you can have overgrowth of bad bacteria. You can have overgrowth of of good bacteria too. So you want to constantly be varying the bacteria that you're exposing to your gut and allow those bacteria to police themselves. The good bacteria will take over bad bacteria and squeeze those bad bacteria out. But you don't just want to be adding in one strain, two strains, even even eight or nine, ten strains, in my opinion. Now, once you get into ten, you're starting to get into a good bit of variety with the strains that you're adding into your your uh, microbiome, your gut flora. But you know, Garden of Life, their their probiotics, which is what we used to recommend or what we used to what I used to take and I, I still do from time to time, but it'll have 29, 30, 31, 32 different strains of bacteria in it. Okay, another one that we really strongly recommend is Prescript Assist. That has 29 strains of beneficial bacteria. So you're getting a good variety of that bacteria. But that is not something that I take every single day. I will take it hard for a week or hard for a month even sometimes, but then slow down and vary it and let my body kind of police itself. Let my body, you know, just re-regulate that gut floor. You give the your body the right building blocks and then allow it to do its thing. We're not trying to trick the body. We're not trying to force it into anything. So probiotics are a huge one. You'd also, I mean, you don't want to just be eating, um, what is it, sauerkraut every, every single day. You know, fermented foods are great, but unless you're using a starter culture, you're getting you know, different, different variety of different strains of bacteria, you can have an overgrowth of a good bacteria just as easily as you can have an overgrowth of a bad bacteria. And, and that's something that's really incredibly important that we're really just starting to learn as the science of the microbiome continues to get larger and larger and larger, and we start to learn more and more and more. So I would definitely not recommend that somebody take the same probiotic over and over and over and over again for the rest of your life. Another one's a fish oil, you know, I, I, or fat variation. You know, fat. Uh, let's not say fish oil, but fat variation. We hear things like, okay, good fats. We got to have good fats. We got to have omega threes. So we maybe take the same fish oil. Well, first off, you know, uh, fish oils are, are questionable. You know, the one that we sell on the shelves, I, I trust. The one that Costco sells on their shelf, I do not trust. Okay, uh, or Walmart or any other uh, big chain store, quite frankly, you know, unless it is something for for me, for most supplements, unless it's physician only, I, I'm not too keen on it. You know, and if it's something that you can get from your neighbor who because she loves her MLM products, don't trust it. I don't trust it, I should say. If it's something that comes from GNC, that you know the guy behind the counter that even though he's big and strong and looks like he spends a lot of time in the gym, might not necessarily be the expert on, on supplements, I don't trust it. Okay, so that that's one thing as far as quality of supplements. But yeah, fish oil, that's something that can be really, really, really great, really beneficial. You know, we've talked in the past, you can go back and listen to past episodes. We do lab work on people looking at their omega-6s versus omega-3s. On average, we found that our patients average 20 omega-6s to 1 omega-3. So we got to raise those omega-3s. That's right. But that doesn't mean that we want to put blinders on and eat all omega-3s. You still need omega-6s. There are anti-inflammatory omega-6s. There are omega-9s. There are saturated fats. There are all kinds of fats. Now, there are some that we want to avoid, period. Trans fats, hydrogenated oils, they are inflammatory 
every single time. There are sh- I mean, sugars the same way. It's inflammatory every single time. I don't want you to, to vary your sugars. I want you to eliminate your sugars. Um, but with fats, we want to vary our fat. So, you know, I'll take a fish oil. I'll also take a cod liver oil from time to time. I will, you know, eat salmon often. But I'll also eat grass-fed meat. And, and with that, you know, I don't just eat grass-fed beef. I'll eat lamb. I'll eat bison. I'll eat organic chicken because they all have different fat compositions to them. Everything is a little bit different, and your body's going to use it a little bit different. I'll eat a lot of plant-based fats. And I'll go through periods of time where I'll focus primarily on plant-based fats, focus on ALA, focus on flaxseed or flaxseed, uh, you know, ground flax, not so much flaxseed oil. It could be rancid. Um, but, you know, go through the nuts and seeds, but really just not getting too hung up on one thing for a really long time period of time. Really, really, really important for your health. The last thing that I want to talk about with variety and variation is your exercise. Okay. And this is a, a you know, pretty obvious one when you look at the way we were designed. And that's why paleo you know, works really well with, with, with CrossFit. You know, CrossFit really popularized the paleo movement or vice versa. I don't really know which order it happened in, but many people think of those two things going hand in hand. One of the basic tenets, the basic foundations of CrossFit is that it's constantly varied. Okay, in what world did we live in where, where somebody did the same activities every single day? You think back ancestrally, you know, even pioneers, you know, one day it was tilling the field, one day it was building a, putting the roof on the house, one day it was milking the cow, one day it was hunting the deer, one day it was gardening the the garden, you know, it's always constantly varied. That's just called real life. You know, we never ancestrally or genetically were designed to just do the exact same thing every single day. Walk in, sit at your desk, sit under fluorescent lights, stare at the computer, type on the keyboard, move the mouse millimeter by millimeter with your with your hand. You know that's another thing. Somebody pointed this out to me one time. Your your arm, your shoulder, is not designed to make m- small, minor, intricate movements like it does all day long with the mouse. The shoulder was designed for spear throwing, for basket weaving, for you know these different activities. It's a big, strong muscle. So, of course, you get carpal tunnel and shoulder problems and, and you know, degenerative issues in your joints when you just sit and you move the mouse and click the mouse and, and type on the computer all day. That's not the way that we were designed. So constantly varying your exercise. You know, this one's a must for me because I get bored. I hate, uh, well, first off, you know, I hate exercise. I, I, I hate programmed exercise, I should say. I hate, you know, going and, and, and do five sets of three or five sets of five rather, you know, squats and bench press. And then the next day do it again. And the next week do it again. Um, You can really strengthen certain muscle groups there, but you're going to create imbalances if you're not working out your full body from every different direction. So that's what I think about exercise, you know, variation as far as high intensity exercise, low intensity exercise, long duration exercise, short duration exercise. I think that, you know, too much long duration endurance exercise can can be harmful to a person in some ways in many ways. In the same way, I think that doing, you know, just lifting weights all the time can be incredibly harmful for people. It'll boost their HDH, it'll boost their lean lean body mass, which is good, really really good for their their number of mitochondria for their you know, some of their metabolic shifts, but it's doing nothing, you know, cardiovascularly. So it, it's a it's a fine balance between all these things. So constant variation. That's a really fun thing when it's just, you know, it comes to moving, moving constantly. You know, I ski, I like to bike, I like to hike, I, but I also like to lift weights. I, I like to play lots of sports. I like to play different games. You know, I hate exercising, but I love having fun. Okay, so I'm always getting exercise. I'm always in relatively good shape, 
but not because I do a program where I run three miles one week and then I run four miles the next week and I do you know couch to 5k that's great if you're going to do a 5k you're going to do a marathon you're going to do a bike race that is awesome train for that but cross training is really really important professional athletes know this not only just for burnout uh, but for phys physical fitness levels and most importantly for overall health levels so that is something that you know has just been weighing on me lately that I just wanted to get across because myself included every healthcare provider you know ha has things that they think that everybody should be doing and so we tell everybody hey you got to be eating good fats you got to be doing this you got to be exercising but there's also this you got to be taking a probiotic right you hear I mean gosh where do you not hear that today but we're missing so much if we're not constantly varying it. So the first level is start doing some of these things. The first level is start eating a healthy diet. The first level is start exercising. The first level is start taking supplements. But for so many people today, they're past that level and they still don't feel well. They still aren't at the level of health that they want to be at even though they've made some minor shifts and some minor changes, this is maybe your next level is to start varying this. Start with the diet variation. The diet variation is going to have the most impact. Starting to add in some of these concepts like fasting, like ketosis, like intermittent fasting, uh, like juicing, uh, water fasting, three, four days, or trying to go seven days. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things. And, and all this, you know, you can read more about it, but don't just start, you know, doing a fast without, you know, consulting somebody first. If you're a patient here, come into the office, ask us about these concepts. If you're not, look it up. Diet variation, exercise variation, and always be changing and varying because your body has what's called homeostasis. And the homeostasis of your body, it's going to get used to things. It's going to, you know, just like walking a mile might be hard for you today. Uh, do it for a week. Next week, it's going to be easy. Your body's always constantly adapting. So you always have to be tricking it. You always have to be switching it up. You always have to be varying how you're uh, addressing your body and what kind of stresses you're putting on it. So that you're not overly stressing it over and over and over again, but you're constantly changing so that that stress produces growth and produces a positive change. So I hope that you got something out of this today. This is one of the most important concepts that, you know, long term is going to have one of the biggest impacts on your overall health. It's a, it's a very healthy, healthy concept. Always be varying. Always have variety. Always have variation within healthy parameters there. So hope you guys got something out of that. This is a, a powerful message, but now the most important thing is putting it to use. So feel free to share with us on our Facebook page, share with us on the podcast page, share with us, comment on one of our pictures on Instagram, send us an email, but let us know about how you're incorporating variety in an incredibly healthy, healthy way. And we'd like to hear about that. So make sure that you follow us online. Make sure that you get our newsletter. And stay tuned for more episodes as we continue to bring you the most cutting-edge information with health and wellness that's available today to allow you to become the strongest version of yourself. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.